we should maybe get started. Um, thank you so much, Renatus, for agreeing to give a talk before you go away in field work. Um, Renatus, as some of you will know, has been sitting on the fourth floor for a little while. He is a Marie Curie um, fellow um, working on a project with Andrea Zuchtoff. Um, and yeah, um, it's Mongolia you're going to field work, right? Yeah. Yes, excellent. Would you prefer questions at the end today or? Doesn't matter, both. Both, both works yeah. for me. Okay. Yeah. So questions during the talk are fine or after the talk. Do remember that the talk is recorded today. So if you would prefer to not be recorded, um, you can ask afterwards, but otherwise it will be included in the recording. We have a huge range of talks now that Anna has very helpfully uploaded to um, our YouTube channel. So remember that you can always have a look at the talks there. Um, and with that, thank you so much for that. Um, yes, yeah. thank you. And thank you for coming. Uh, at the beginning, I think I should explain myself. What am I doing here at the IMC? It's kind of Wednesday breakfast tradition style. Uh, introduce myself. Uh, I've been bouncing uh, you know, from one discipline to another over the years. And I've been in anthropology at the beginning, then cognitive science a little bit philosophy, psychology department, so I was kind of moving from one place to another, so kind of identity crisis in terms of academic work in some sense. So this is a great place for me to be. I guess most of you had the same crisis at some point. So, so by the end of the day, I kind of decided to call myself cognitive anthropologist. Uh, cognitive because I'm interested in uh, cognition, and anthropologist because I'm interested in culture and doing you know, field research. In, in, in faraway places. In my case, is, is Mongolia. So, and this project, this Marie Curie project, is, is, is kind of a, a uh, product of, of this long journey of mine, so to say. And uh, I, I'm trying to, to look at the mainstream cognitive science and philosophy of mind, and how we talk about theory of mind, so to say, from a more cognitive anthropology perspective you know, and bring culture into the picture and see what are the problems perhaps and uh, how can we uh, study that and, 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 and what are, you know, possible future solutions. So this talk today is going to be a little bit eclectic. It's a, it's a work in progress, thinking in progress, so to say. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to put it forward for myself, of like thinking out loud, so to say, uh, before going to the field. Uh, and uh, if you have questions along the way, just, just please, please do ask. OK, but let's start from you know, the landscape, the conceptual landscape of this theory of mind. As you know, it's a, it's a huge thing in cognitive sciences and, and, and philosophy included. And the and first thing that we notice in the literature and in, 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 in research is that it's is some sort of big umbrella term, social cognition. And under this social cognition umbrella, you, you can find a variety of terms that are used interchangeably very often, like theory of mind, mind reading, you know, folk psychology, <coughs> and something like that. Mentalizing, you can say. And, and these uh, terms are used interchangeably, but sometimes you, you sense that there are some differences in some other texts. Okay. What is uh, mostly common use is theory of mind and mind reading as interchangeably. And it kind of refers to you know, some sort of capacity uh, human capacity, kind of directly uh, unobservable mental states that you attribute to others, mainly belief and desire, that you know systematically uh, help us to explain and predict others' behavior. This is the most general kind of understanding in this in this literature what it means. So basically, the focus is uh, belief desire type of psychology, and then prediction and explanation. Uh, that's the, the type of uh, uh, definition that most of the people work in this, in this field. And folk psychology is also used in that bunch of you know, terms the same way, but sometimes you can find a reference as, as some sort of more general understanding of how people, folk, understand what mind is, and you can name other aspects besides uh, belief, desire, prediction, explanation, and so on and so on. But it's also interchangeably used. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of I'm going to stick to theory of mind for the sake of argument as as as, as a reference point. 
And these are kind of sometimes used as interchangeable in the sense that social cognition is reduced to theory of mind. That's all there is to so social cognition. Okay. But it's not the case uh, the, uh, among, uh, not the case uh, for, for some researchers who might say that we might have social cognition without theory of mind and mind reading and stuff like that. This is an interesting kind of aspect to look at it as well for my purposes as well. Uh, but in all this field, my impression, this is maybe my impression, culture, and in my case as I use it, cultural models, uh, conspicuously absent in some sense. They might refer to culture as some sort of factor important for the development of theory of mind and things like that, but there is a very little understanding what it is, how it works, how, it develop, how development is affected by culture and things like that. And I tried to fit that question in, in, in this talk, how actually we can think about culture and theory of mind, and how we can probl problematize the very notion of theory of mind through the lenses of you know, uh, cultural theory or anthropology, let's put it in general ways. So conceptual landscape could be also you know, uh, divided or kind of uh, the theories or positions could be kind of uh, uh, discussed along this uh, continuum of, of how they see where the theory of mind comes from, the origins of it. Okay. On one side you might have, you know, hardcore uh, innate nativists who talk about uh, cognitive modules and very often theory of mind is understood and explained in both terms. And, and one of the examples is, is like uh, Leslie and others and Carefers who, who talk about fear of mind and its development as being, uh, you know, not seem to be dependent on the character of the environment at all. So there is some sort of understanding, a little bit Fodorian understanding of what is, you know, module in this case, encapsulated some sort of cognitive system that is cognitively impenetrable by higher order kind of processes, including cultural, uh, kind of internalized cultural models as I will use it, okay? So this is one way to look at it, where it comes from, and you can situate many other positions along this line, and then you have evidential kind of basis that we try to uh, build and, and defend this position, it's, it's like a folk, um, this, uh, Mm, false belief tasks with, with uh, children, uh, verbal type of task and nonverbal type of task with time, <coughs> measuring time of, 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 of toddlers, so to say. And this is, this is also a literature that I'm not going to look at it, it's, it's, it's problematic in itself and I'm sure that some of you know better than I do. But they try to base their position on this evidential uh, base, so to say. And then you have more kind of learner, learning leaning position, <coughs> so-called theory theorists who talk about the development of theory of mind as a, as a, as a long process of learning and, and, and kind of finding out as scientists certain you know, theory of mind understanding. Okay. And they have a much more flexible understanding of what uh, theory of mind is and where it comes from. A lot of uh, input is needed from environment, especially from language and, and stuff like this. So it's more flexible in terms of time frame, as I understand it, this position, and it can uh, be affected by the lack of stimulation for language, and the, the, the theory of mind could develop much later, and so on and so on. And they also have evidence for that type of position where language you know, promotes false belief understanding and so on and so on. My point to, to, to put these positions is kind of show that uh, we have, you know, continuum of different positions along the innate and learning kind of spectrum, okay? You might have different understanding, like stimulation theory, for instance, also could be put somewhere in this, in this uh, continuum. And, and even though we can talk about learning on this theory theory side, okay? Culture is not explicated that much. When they talk about learning, they talk about individual learning of children. Okay, so individual learning of children where they kind of uh, 
converge at some point to a theory of mind with core concepts, quite similar to the innate understanding. It's just that at some point children converge, a scientist converge on certain theories uh, over the years. Okay? So cultural input in here is not kind of discussed that much. To be honest, Wellman actually discussed a little bit and he did some work with uh, Chinese children and some, some, uh, some, some of his students did with, with uh, uh, Samoan and some other places. They do talk about culture, but my impression of this understanding what culture is is a little bit impoverished and it's not kind of uh, uh, well explicated what they mean and how culture affects this development of this uh, theory. Okay. So let's just leave it at that. Now, to bring it all together, we can say that these positions still kind of stick to some sort of conceptual core. Whether it is innate position, whether it is theory-theory position, whether it is uh, simulation theory, you name it. My impression is they have this kind of conceptual core, okay, that children develop at some point, and it's kind of, you know, intention, desire, belief-based kind of common sense psychology. Okay. Something that uh, philosophers talked for many years and centuries, where uh, uh, common sense psychology is basically reduced to this uh, desire-belief psychology in that sense. And that core is, is not questioned uh, in those positions, as I see it. Uh, uh, but, but we do have cultural concepts that are you know, coming together with uh, all the other stuff that children learn. And for the most part, children learn, you know, culturally saturated environments. They observe, participate, they are instructed in different kinds of languages. So the input is huge in terms of cultural input, okay? And that kind of input should somehow interact with this core, right? But how it interacts with this core is, 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 is not clear to me in these positions, okay? In the innate side, they kind of talk about if I understand them well, that the, the, the modular kind of conceptual core develops. It's not that it's kind of you know, static and it's never uh, developed and never matures. There is some sort of learning instinct, so to say, as they call it. A learning system. It, is, it learns okay, over the years. But the whole process happens in this encapsulated system only. Then they have some sort of reference to, to culture, that cultural concepts come in. But I have no idea how the cultural concepts and cultural models interact with that stuff. Uh, I'm still kind of puzzled about this uh, position. Uh, but, you know, 20 or so years ago, uh, Lillard, she addressed that question for the first time in that literature, to my knowledge, uh, and, and tried to say that, look, we have different languages and cultures and, and different assumptions that people bring when they talk about the world, ontological assumptions, you can say, and, 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 and beliefs, uh, religious beliefs, whatever, that, that, that somehow affect how people think about the mental, okay? The mental, emotionals, and, and these things are not trivial. We should take into account and think about them seriously and try to find this connection between core and learned. Okay. So she, she, she just brought certain kind of questions. And, um, and, and, and my, my understanding, I mean, this is a little bit underappreciated work. <laughs> and, and why it is underappreciated? It, 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 it <coughs> even these guys, um, they kind of dismissed that. Okay. And how they did that? It's, it's, it's kind of Lillard's kind of view of cross-cultural theory of mind differences pertains only to the inessential fluorescences of mature Tom competence rather than to its essential character, you know, in early acquisition. That's uh, to my, if you have my anthropological head on my head, so to say. This is an astonishing statement in some sense, okay. Uh, dismissiveness of cultural influence is, is, is is quite visible in the cognitive sciences and philosophy of mind when we talk about folk psychology. But not everyone, of course, are that dismissive. Someone would say, okay, culture is important, blah, 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 but then they don't go on and explicate what they mean by that. Okay, that's my impression of the literature. But Lillard herself 
had good points, it's just few of them, that, that they should have been taken, yeah, I guess that's the grammar, uh, on board and, 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 and kind of integrate in, in the research. These guys think about the, the, the theory of mind as a theory, right? If we take this assumption, then if knowledge about mind is really theoretical, as, as Lillard notes, then constructs are defined in terms of other constructs in the theory, right? That's how science works, okay? That being the case, variation in the non-core, that's the place, set mandates variation in the core set, calling universals into question. That's a reasonable kind of uh, observation, right? But how you can deal with it, uh, it's, it's still not clear, you know, according uh, to the literature that I read. Okay. Um, and, and, and again, if, if we look at the more kind of linguistic level, if we, we, we look for mental terms across different cultures, and, and, and let's say, let's assume we did find certain similar kind of concepts or terms that refer to similar kind of concepts, we still cannot be confident that we talk about the same thing. Okay? She notices that there are concepts that could be translated in other languages, but when you look in a wider kind of cultural uh, connotations, when you, when you take on board cultural connotations that bring these concepts in different indigenous languages, let's say, you find a very different picture. This is my impression from Mongolia as well, to some extent. So, so these are reasonable questions that should be addressed, in my view. And uh, it's not, you know, just to be sure, I'm not dismissing the possibility of some core aspects in our psychology that are devoted to understanding others' behavior. There are some things, probably, but we should take culture more seriously if we want to see what exactly is at the core, okay? Uh, not to assume that our uh, Western and English-based language intuitions are all there is to say about it. Okay. So, so why, 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 why is belief, desire, base type of uh, core, this idea of, of, of Tom, put forward this kind of unquestionable uh, element of social cognition. And, and cultural input is regarded as an essential fluorescence, if you, if, if you will. Why, why is it so, you know, so easily dismissed? I mean, my, my answer, if this is kind of more cognitive anthropological approach, and this is my answer, I'm not saying that everyone would, should go and work with this, is cult that culture is opaque in practice and in theory. And I will explain what I mean by culture is opaque in practice and in theory. In theory, first of all, it is opaque because uh, we don't see culture as, 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 a, as, as a force in development of, of understanding of others' behavior, okay, in theoretical notion. But in practice, all of us don't actually see how culture operates uh, in terms of our own behavior and interpreting others. So, so what do I mean? by that, so uh, just briefly, mm, I don't want to go into discussions about what culture is and is not, it's just for, for me a technical kind of definition that is, uh, it works for me, uh, it's broad enough, it can narrow down to some elements, but culture is kind of refers to all kinds of information, I, I'm, I, I take this cognitive aspect cognitive definition of culture, okay? Informational definition. That kinds of information and things also material culture, we should not dismiss that. That humans create and socially transmit to others and retain, you know. So these kind of simple elements of, of cultural information, if you will, cultural representations. And, and humans, uh, you know, rely on culture information to survive, and it's not uh, nothing new here for anthropologists, especially evolutionary anthropologists, that culture uh, is something that drove our species to that type of success that we enjoy now. Okay. 
it accumulated over the years and cultural evolution had a effect on our survival and we enjoy it now okay so so we could say that cultural learning is something specific for us humans but cultural type of learning cultural type of information learning and 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 uh, research and human imitation and over imitation kind of shows that there are certain mechanisms that definitely are unique to humans. You cannot find a lot among uh, other primates. Um, I, I cannot comment on that, I'm not an expert, but my understanding that it makes sense to say that we humans are really prone and we are very sensitive to cultural type of information. Okay? Now, that's all nice. Okay? cultural information that is shared. We have kind of socially transmitted information and it's shared in the group. But in order to make sense of this kind of shared information, I, I, I suggest also to talk about cultural models because it helps to systematize and organize cultural knowledge within you know, cultural groups. And it's, this kind of information understanding is, you know, gives me a more flexible notion of culture. There are no clear boundaries. There is a variation of, of, of expertise of particular cultural knowledge due to many factors. You know, it could be novices, experts, you know, due to you know, different sexes, ages. These are different factors that affect the cultural knowledge within groups and cultural you know, information can go from one group to another easily. So there is some sort of flexible notion of it. But in order for cultural group, you know, in, in terms of more you know, Stat if you want to look at it statically, certain group shares certain amount of cultural representations. Uh, and I would call them cultural models. Okay. I hope it's clear so far. Okay. So what I mean, what do I mean by cultural models? Uh, this is a term that is coined by cognitive anthropologists in the United States. They, they kind of been developing Mm, this idea for the past 30, 40 years or so. Uh, and my take on this construct of cultural models is that besides talking about you know, shared schemes, as they mostly talk about that, uh, cultural model is intersubjectively, that means uh, in the group between individuals, shared action guiding cultural knowledge. And this knowledge is intrinsically connected to normative cognition. So cultural models, as I see it, are intrinsically normative. And action guiding, that means there are certain situations where you're compelled to behave in a certain way. So we are in this room and we are compelled to behave in a certain way because we have certain rules how uh, audience and a speaker should behave in this type of setting. And we do that automatically. We don't have to think about those rules. We don't have to put them in your working memory and, and deliberate about them. We just you know, uh, enact them without a thought. Okay? So that's the type of cultural uh, model that I had in mind. Okay? So these are the elements of the cultural model that I kind of uh, put forward. And, and it's still work in progress. There is a chapter that will come uh, in a book by, by these guys. The collection, and I suggest them that actually you cannot talk about cultural models without uh, noting that these are intrinsically normative. Okay, that these are compelling us to work uh, to, to to do things in a certain way. Okay, and and shared concepts and conceptual structures. That's fine. That's what they talk about. But also we have certain attitudes. We when we are internalizing cultural models would take certain things for granted as if things should be that way. There, there is some sort of attitudinal aspect to that that we believe we take things for granted. Okay? Uh, and then we have certain shared action plans that there are certain situations that when we are in social type of situations, we automatically enact them, you know, certain scripts. And they're normative, we are compelled to act and enforce that action if something is violated in front of us. So that's uh, broad, you know, in broad strokes, how I understand. That's, uh, I, I'm, sh I'm sure we can discuss each and every element separately, but I want to just put forward the way I understand it. Okay? And just to wrap up my 
notion of cultural models. You could say these are kind of prior expectations that we internalized, okay? And in, in a normal kind of situation where things just go smoothly, okay? When we act and interact without any problem and smoothly, you know, automatic application, you know, uh, kind of automatically use the, 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 the cultural knowledge that we internalize without thinking about that. There is no conscious appraisal, there is no need for that. But if we encounter certain violation, you know, someone did something that is not according to the script, not according to the cultural model, we notice it and we might consciously appraise <coughs> that and this is the, the, the moment when we definitely could use mental state to explain what's happening. Okay. But for the most part, there is no need to think about that if things are go smoothly. And you can, you know, cash that, that out in predictive coding terms. I'm, I'm really open for that, and I think I'm going to look into that more, more, more deeply and closely, because cultural models as cultural priors, probably, you know, where, where things are perfectly matching, where there are no big errors, so to say, uh, you just act without any conscious uh, monitoring. And most of the culture that I'm talking about is like this. Okay? We are pushed and pulled by cultural models without our deliberate kind of decision making for the most part. But it is important consciously think about that when we encounter certain errors in our social environment. Okay. Then we definitely need to make sense of what is happening. So it's not that everything is unconscious, but I think much of it. So this is a good example, like in this case you go to a restaurant and uh, and some familiar places just, you know, activates kind of cultural affordances, if you will. Things uh, uh, are familiar and it activates and smoothly operates and we don't have any problem just behaving nicely in the restaurant, nicely in the setting. What is, uh, what the problem happens is when you go into unfamiliar places. And I think every anthropologist can, you know, tell you that when you're in a completely new space, and this is kind of Mongolian yurt, none of you know any rules how to behave in, 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 in the yurt and the cultural models that you operate with will break down and you start noticing something is not you know fitting here or something I must do something that means I must learn new cultural stuff for that type of environment and a new environment actually is good for, for <laughs> mental health us because we, we start seeing that our models cultural models are actually cultural models that's when we start noticing them when they break down Okay, so that's the, the, the general kind of framework. A uh, yeah, methodological side note on intuition, so innate or cultural. So I was thinking, while I was thinking about cultural models, and then kind of uh, reading time after time uh, literature and psychology, or experimental philosophy where they talk about intuitions, very often they talk that intuitions are coming from some sort of cognitive basic stuff. Are we sure about that? If I'm right that cultural models are as automatic and unconscious, and intuitions coming from cultural models as strong as coming from more kind of basic stuff, so how can we be sure that we're talking about the basic cognitive stuff and not cultural stuff? So that's a kind of methodological uh, side note as well to keep in mind for myself. So, yeah, to come back to the uh, at the beginning, why cognitive scientists and philosophers think that uh, belief, desire, psychology is, is, is something at the core of our social cognition, understanding others and ourselves. Okay. So is it a weird or universal intuition? And we know well from certain uh, reviews and, 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 and a book by, by, by Hendrik that the weird people actually developed pretty weird psychology over the centuries due to a certain, you know, uh, changes in the middle age church that are uh, uh, fathers of the church and wittingly made certain rules and it kind of rolled down and made certain changes in the ways people start seeing themselves and the world around them. That's an interesting kind of insight, I would say, and 
And these weird people are actually now doing research in cognitive science and philosophy. Okay. So do we, <laughs> how much our intuitions are, uh, you know, immune to biases? I would say, you know, read that stuff and you start thinking that probably we have <coughs> some problems in our own intuitions before going to the labs, uh, uh, constructing designs, and, 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 and thinking about that topic. Okay. And, and <coughs> the problem here is that most of the research, and I just, just, just mentioned that sample is basically a weird sample. And the theory of mind is no exclusion here. We might have certain, you know, uh, you know, exceptions. There are a few good exceptions, but uh, for the most part, these are not only kind of uh, Western-based, but it's also English-based. You know, and English language is another weird uh, tool, so to say, to think about things that are supposedly universal. Okay, so this is. The, the backdrop of the whole um, question that I put here, universal or weird. I mean, we should keep in mind that, that uh, uh, we rely on evidence that is exceptionally Western-based, that the sample is not as diverse as we would need it to be for universalistic claims. Okay. So just to give you a couple of examples that are pretty relevant, and I just to show the confidence of, of philosophers, let's say, in, in, in talking about uh, folk psychology. All of you know uh, Fodor and his, his uh, modularity of mind book. He took an example of uh, uh, Müller-Lyer illusion, as something that is pretty you know, rigid and universal in terms of, of, of uh, perception apparatus. Okay. That, that that's an example of how perceptual systems are cognitively impenetrable for 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 Fodor in, in his understanding, and he was very confident about that. The thing is that uh, under his nose, some evidence already existed that when you go to certain African uh, ethnic groups like uh, San and in South Africa. Uh, and give the same type of illusion and, and, and then see how, how much do you need to add for, for both lines to be the same length, okay? You see that basically there is no susceptibility to that illusion among these uh, hunter-gatherers. Susceptibility grows when you go to the Western type of uh, sample, okay? And, and one of the explanations is that people living in a, ecological and kind of uh, cultural environment that has no carpented corners. Okay. We live in a carpented corners kind of world. The architecture is basically full of that type of corners where might create that susceptibility, that type of illusion. So it is affected by the culturally constructed environment. Okay. Through, you know, long term, of course, this kind of diachronic perspective, but it was affected. So you can dismiss that example as, you know, impenetrability of perception in some extent. So if we do find, you know, penetrability of cultural stuff into perception, okay, so what about then folk psychology? And Fodor here is even more <laughs> confident about that. So he says, there is so far, to his knowledge, no human group that doesn't explain behavior by imputing beliefs and desires to the behavior. And if an anthropologist claimed to have found such a group, I would not believe him. That's another astonishing, you know, <laughs> confidence that you can find in the literature, right? So, again, you know, under his nose, there were some interesting uh, findings. And just to give you one example from that. That's an interesting paper by John Miller in, in uh, 84 or something like that, just right before the publication of Fodor's book, uh, where she basically asked Indian and American uh, participants about 
uh, like think about someone who did something bad, like two examples of kind of uh, bad behavior and a good behavior, and then try to explain why they did it. Okay. And the sample had uh, different age groups as well. And what we find here is that uh, Americans most of the time have personal attributions to an agent in the stories, why they did it. So basically from internal uh, mental states, the explanation kind of comes. Okay? And for Indians, basically the situational uh, attributions were the dominant ones. So the contextual relational things, the social uh, things, how an actor is related to someone in that particular situation, how the context might constrain the behavior and things like that. So these are the, the, the elements that Indians kind of looked at more closely and immediately, rather than like Americans who immediately looked into the personal dispositions why someone did something. So there is some sort of uh, a default application of some frame of mind. Let's, it, uh, let's call it a, a model, okay. And uh, in that sense, you would say that Western cultural model, if you want, okay, automatically searches for some inner psychological states to explain what's happening, okay, and predict maybe the future. And for Indians, it's like automatic search for, you know, contextual and relational cues. And that's, that's, that's already an interesting kind of difference in terms of how much you need of mental ex uh, states to explain others' mental states to explain certain behavior. Okay, and and on top of that, anthropologists uh, began talking about interesting cultural features in you know Pacific uh, islands, where in these Pacific islands there is some sort of norm and a rule uh, that you should not talk about others' inner mental states. They are discouraged to think and talk about other mental states. The opacity of mind uh, model among the Pacific cultures. And what you should do if, if, you, if you try to explain something, you should do the same like Indians do. You should refer to contextual and relational cues. Okay. But Ford wouldn't believe that, right? So here you have this kind of um, one way to look at it. So if you know, ordinary folk default to explanations of behavior in terms of belief and desire, okay, this type of states, and cognitive scientists are also Western folk, don't you agree about that? So they are also probably biased by the same kind of default settings. You know. So when we start talking <laughs> about theory of mind, we start looking for things that are familiar to us, you know, that are intuitive to us, that our default setting is actually put like this. Okay. We don't try to look at the things that Indians do or in the Pacific Island. Okay. So, so there is a, a concern here that, 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 that uh, we should keep in mind when we generalize our intuitions. Okay. The best way to check our own intuitions and our biases, travel more. Do research in other cultures, like I do. <laughs> uh, so the the, the cultural model, you know, Western cultural model uh, of mind, and I put in quotation marks here because the mind can be changed with other indigenous places if we talk about other places. Uh, and that's kind of the, 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 the basic uh, diagram from uh, Dandrade, who is a cognitive anthropologist. And, and, and uh, he did several interviews, in-depth in interviews about how people think uh, about uh, mental stuff. Okay. And it's just the same stuff that you find in philosophers and cognitive sciences. Belief, desire, and things like that. It's, it's something that plays a huge role in explaining what's happening. Uh, now, before going to the case of Mongolian example, I, I want to show that too. Oh man, we don't have much time. Uh, I want to address the mind uh, itself, uh, the term mind. You know, the mind, as an English word, is everyday kind of word, but it's also a technical word in sciences. Okay. So it's used interchangeably. It's even, it, it kind of, it creates a loop of intuition. So as a folk, using mind in everyday, probably you would use that intuition in your 
professional setting as well, when you talk about the, the, the more technical stuff in cognitive sciences. But the mind, as, as, as Zbitska, the, the linguist, Polish-born Australian linguist, uh, uh, as she argued, the mind is, you know, is, is a folk concept that reflects you know, English language and its connotations. And, and, and it's very interesting that you know, we don't have this immediate understanding that this is a folk term, a folk concept. But when we kind of start talking about like, Japanese words, kokoro, or ki, they kind of, for us, look as cultural concepts. Why is such an asymmetry? Why, why kokoro is not that concept that we start our work and look into our universals? Okay? So there is some sort of already biased uh, pull towards universalism when we talk and use English words, like mind. Okay? And this is a problem, and her book also shows that, that you know, imprisoned in English, we don't reflect about the possible influences of the English language in academia that we use. And in cognitive science, in this recent paper, it's quite, quite interesting. <laughs> Over reliance on English, you know, hinders cognitive science. And that can be in many dimensions. You know, this one is just, you know, lexical, the mind, the term itself that connects to some other things. But it's, we should be, you know, weary. We should be worried about that and, and, and try to capture when we start using these type of intuitions, okay? So that's the mind. But also we have this theory of mind. And theory as a construct is also a problem to some extent, okay? You know, this is a scientific type of theory, as we talk about that. Uh, that we, you know, use unobservable mental states, you know, attribute them in order to explain a behavior. But, uh, you know, the question for me is, do people use this type of theory, as a scientific type of theory, to arrive at interpersonal understanding without any influence of internalized cultural models? An example from India is one, exa if, if one of the examples. Another example would be is that probably if we do employ certain mental terms in the indigenous language and culture, do they really bring this scientific type of application? Or there are some other assumptions, some ontological assumptions, how the world is built, you know, how, what's the place of the mental in that particular understanding of the world? and so on and so on. So these are questions that anthropologists ask very often. And these are not trivial questions because they might influence how people see the world and others around them. Okay. So these are important questions that we should keep in mind as well. So probing folk philosophies of mind across different languages and cultures would be one way to address that issue. So an instruction just replace mind with uh, indigenous terms, you know, and, and indigenous terms should not be the same as the mind, because there is, I uh, guess, I didn't mention. Mind has no translation in most of the languages. Even Danish, I think, that you don't have this direct translation of that. So, so mind is, is, is some sort of uh, extremely limited, in terms of its usage in English, and, and I don't find it also in other languages. But you have mental terms in other languages, and, and Danish also they have mental terms that could be used in that type of. So the probing questions could be like, like, what mind is made of? I mean, the mental. These are assumptions that probably could have certain impact on how people think about themselves and others, about persons and interrelation of these persons. So what Western type of understanding here, as I see it, like thinking and knowing stuff, okay? How mind is related to body, largely separated from body in the Western. Uh, how mind is related to body and soul, let's not forget that uh, in different cultures, and even in uh, Western context, people use uh, uh, terms referred to soul that are important when they talk about persons and explain their behavior too. So there are some other religious-based kind of concepts that are uh, important in this context too. So is mind permeable? Okay. So largely is bounded in the West. But these questions make sense in other religion context as well. And what kind of entities can be with that type of minds? Okay. So 
talking about the first one, as I mentioned, thinking and knowing stuff in the Western context and the kind of linguistic analysis done by Ushbiska shows that. Uh, then we can uh, see examples in psychology where they you know, take up this intuition and apply it to uh, explaining people's beliefs in afterlife. Things like that? Oh, yeah. Yes. So let's skip it. Uh, but there are problems, 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 problems. <laughs> and we <laughs> skip the problems. Okay. I'll, I'll kind of briefly mention the last one. This is where I want to kind of uh, look more closely in Mongolia. Okay. Five minutes, okay. I'll try to... to uh, the long way to, to the case of Mongolian uh, mental terms and uh, uh, there is no mind translation in Mongolian. That's, 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 that's clear. We can be clear about that. Uh, and uh, I kind of did a, a site data collection last year before coming to, to, to Denmark. And I, through my network, asked certain questions about uh, one particular term that is of biggest kind of uh, importance in Mongolian language as I see it. So I chose sitkil as the term, and this is an interesting choice because in dictionary it is the, the, the richest mental term that you can find in Mongolian. Okay? That's the criteria that I applied. It, it has the most uh, kind of um, wide usage. You can, it, mostly Sitgil is used in combination with other words, and you can find like 160 something kind of combinations of this word to denote very specific nuanced you know, emotional states and, and whatever, what have you. Uh, and another interesting fact is just that they translated uh, you know, Western uh, psychology as you know, Sitgil Sotlau, and this is basically a study of Sitgil. So I thought, okay, that's interesting. So they have a department of uh, psychology which is called, you know, Sitkil Sodlalin, you know, in him and, 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 and they call it as a psychology department. So pro probably they talk about the, the Im important uh, mental thing here. And then I could ask, you know, the same questions, the same probing questions, and this is what I did just online by, by probing my uh, friends who could go from friends and friends and, uh, and, and First thing, uh, I, I did free listing and asked what uh, the Sitgil is composed of. And uh, I don't go, don't want to go into free listing. We had this talk before. A Sitgil basically is, is, is uh, composed of elements that you would not find in English mind. Okay. Uh, when you put it into this kind of more diagramic thing and you show the, the, the aspects of what actually it covers, you, you get the more kind of epistemic cognition type of things, but also you have a lot of related to feeling, but the most interesting parts are for me, the, the rest of it is kind of, it relates to body. It's not only mind and thinking, but it's also body things. It's related to social emotions, it's related to you know soul, and it's related to action and context in some sense. This is not a rich kind of uh, type of data yet. It's, it's, it's pretty shallow. They didn't provide the long lists, it's just a pilot study that I kind of can, you know, uh, use and jump off for my, 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 my field work. So, so that's an interesting thing. Another question that I asked is also, uh, so how Sitgil and body and soul are related? And I draw this kind of circle, say, okay, tell me, completely unrelated, completely related. Okay. So one of them was just body and Sitgil, another one, body, Sitgil and soul. Okay. And, and, the diff and, and I found that it's just completely almost the same thing. Okay. As you see from the free list, these are very much connected. There is no uh, big kind of uh, dualistic understanding of, of, of the uh, more kind of physiological processes, if you will, and, and, and mental processes and emotional things like that. So that's the kind of the fault understanding. And is it permeable? Okay. That one was less clear. <coughs> was it the midpoint? Do shamans, like shaman type of people over the distance can affect your sitgil? Like spirits, ancestors can affect your, uh, uh, your sitgil? These are the questions for Mongolians that make sense, but I asked 
mostly you know, city, uh, city Mongolians from Ulaanbaatar. And even city Mongolians, they kind of have pretty high understanding of these things, pretty traditional, in my view. My, ex my experience is that they're pretty much traditional. You just scratch, scratch the surface and you see the nomad in the city. And, and this one is most interesting to me because as some sort of animism index, okay, you can ask, so what kind of bodies, entities, we don't have this term, but bodies uh, with Sidgi, we have Sidgi. And, and again, animals, insects, streets, spirit masters, these are important nature spirits, mountains and rivers. Okay? And these are very much related things. Uh, we should keep in mind that Mongolian uh, folk religiosity and kind of uh, traditional understanding is very much animistic. And this one kind of gave me some understanding and kind of to check how animistic, and they're pretty animistic. Mountains and rivers are, you know, pretty uh, much with Sidgil as well, the way they understand it. It won't make sense to say that they have mind, they have Sidgil. Okay? So these are uh, interesting things and uh, an interesting kind of immediate correlations just, just for, for fun. So animistic stance kind of is, 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 is related to Sid Gilbad and soul being related. And that animistic stance, you know, is, 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 is that Sid Gil is permeable by spirits and ancestors. So these are very different kind of assumptions about what mental is, what entities has mentality, how it is connected, and all so on and so on. So putting all together, as I understand it, is, is you know, Mongolian notion of, of Sid Gil is just one of the many that I uh, planning to look at a bit more deeply. It's kind of connected, you know, uh, <coughs> with wider animistic understanding of, of, you know, relational understanding of, of personhood in this, in this case. Uh, just to, to check more in the field, but, uh, but I think we should stop here. It's just, <coughs> you should ask questions. I'll just skip it. All right.